Welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study of the Prophecies of the Book of Daniel. Joel Richardson's been taking us through Daniel 7 and 8, our last few sessions, and I'm going to jump in today and pick up on a very important text. Today, our session title, our text is Daniel 8, verses 9 through 14, but if you're looking for a title for this, it would be something along the lines of one of the most important end-time prophecies in the Bible you've probably never heard of. I believe that Daniel 8, 9 through 14 is one of the most significant eschatological prophecies in all of Scripture. We're going to dive into it today, go word by word through it. We're also making this available, this session available on YouTube. So for any of you who are not tracking with us and want to get kind of a feel for what these Maranatha Global Bible Studies are like, jump in with us. Head over to the FAI app. You can download the app and all the sessions are available on there, as well as the notes today. If you want these notes for this session, you can head over to the app and, and get the PDF version of the notes. Today, we're going to work through, we're just going to journey through this text word by word. Pardon my allergies. I'm in the Golan Heights and it's high allergy season here. Spring is in bloom and uh, we were going to shoot outside. It was a beautiful spring day today and got everything set up out there and pollen is just dominating us. So we decided to come inside and do it in one of our editing bays here. So welcome to one of our editing bays in the Golan Heights. This is where we're going to be jumping into Daniel today. So with that, Lord, we just pray for a spirit of revelation as we open up this, this key passage, and we just ask you to give wisdom and discernment and give, Lord, tender hearts as we work through these difficult, notoriously difficult passages. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't already turned there, turn to Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. We're going to work our way through verses 9 through 14, but before I do that, I want to address a number of preliminary observations that I think are just helpful to lay the groundwork. Joel's done a phenomenal job of laying the context for the last chapter, Daniel 7, and giving us context for Daniel 8, and we're picking up in really a, a jugular part of Daniel chapter 8 today. And Joel, if you haven't listened to those sessions, go jump in from the beginning and, and go with us because all of this is very much interconnected. Daniel 7 through 12 is a series of encounters that Daniel had. And these encounters are, uh, there's a lot of internal logic. There's a lot of overlap and dovetailing. The main characters and themes in chapter 7 are also in chapter 8, chapter 9, chapters 10 through 12. So if you haven't, go back and listen to those. With that, number one, preliminary observation. These are things that I think are helpful for us to understand this, this text. In your notes here, Daniel 8 is one of the most significant prophetic passages in the Bible concerning specific events and dates leading up to the close of this present age. Now, anytime we're dealing with the intersection of dates and prophecy, I think it's important to exercise caution and wisdom. There's two ditches that we can slide down. One is completely delegitimizing de the issue of dates and events related to prophecy because of kooky stuff and kooky people. And so we mock it, we scoff it, we disregard it, we walk away from it. That's an error. That is an error. Just because people have abused date setting and predictions where prophecy is concerned doesn't mean that you should scoff at that which the scripture is given. The other error is to be kooky and to take and to make everything about these dates. Now, there's a lot of people who've, you know, built careers off of, uh, you know, focusing on on dates and, and predictions and uh, I would say. Um, sensational prophetic uh, speculation. And with that said, I think here's a helpful rubric for what how we want to approach specifically the issue of dates. We want to shout what the Bible shouts. We want to whisper what the, the Bible whispers. And we want to be silent where the Bible is silent. And the reality is that if dates were irrelevant and if, if they had no bearing and no there's no reason for them, then the Lord would not have commissioned the angel Gabriel to communicate the dates and Jesus would not have commanded us to read and understand them, which leads to our next preliminary observation. Second is this, is that one of the verses in the passage that we're going to look at today from Daniel 8 is the singular passage that Jesus laid his eschatological teaching on in Matthew 24. He commanded us to study it and to understand it. And so, I mean, that's profound. He, Daniel is the only person that Jesus called 
a prophet in this way and, and took his prophecies in Matthew 24 and said, if you want to understand the end of the age, just, just study this. And he says specifically this passage and a number, about four or five other passages connected to this one. But this passage in particular is the, the, the bottom layer, the foundation of Jesus's eschatology and thus the eschatology of the apostles as well. This chapter, Daniel 8, is at the heart of New Testament eschatology, which is kind of a new idea, I think. Most people, I think, that are very pro-New Testament would say, like, what, what does Daniel 8 have to do with New Testament? Well, why is it that Jesus and the apostles, this is their number one text that they quote when they're trying to explain the dynamics of the return of the Lord and the, and the events that lead up to the return of the Lord? Jesus made it the foundational statement. Paul to the Thessalonians, a text that we'll look at, this is the foundational statement. The Apostle John makes this a foundational statement. It's repeated and reiterated in the book of Revelation. It, this is a normal baseline reality, and I found that it's within uh, modern Christianity, we're not even aware of. We ne no one ever reads this chapter, let alone preaches or teaches or writes books on it, except for some kooky guys. And that, I think, has even more so compounded the crisis of biblical illiteracy concerning the end of the age. The third preliminary observation is that while part of Daniel 8 touches on events from history past, the climactic passages of the chapter refer to the eschaton, or the end of the age, or the day of the Lord. The case for a historical fulfillment of Daniel 8 is hollow and incoherent, incoherent. So we're not really going to delve into that. If you're interested in that, you can. there's lots of resources online about it. Most left-leaning liberal scholarship, most uh, cynical critis, scholarly criticism would put Daniel 8 in history past, which isn't surprising. But the reality is this, is that Jesus and Paul put Daniel 8 in the future. So that settles it. So we're not even going to really give... Uh, even a hearing to that argument because it's it's totally hollow and totally incoherent on the basis that Jesus said, if you want to understand the end of the age, study Daniel. Thus, he's saying this hasn't happened in history, history past. The fourth thing that we're gonna we want to observe or that we see is that the chapter revolves around the single most catalytic event in biblical prophecy. That is the invasion of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple that will have been recently rebuilt at the time of its future destruction. The desolation of Jerusalem and the defiling of the future temple is the most emphasized event in eschatology, in the eschatology of the prophets and the apostles, hands down. It's the number one catalytic event that the prophets and the apostles set forth as the catalytic event, the chain reaction goes forth from there. The centrality and the gravity of this event needs to be understood. It's also critical for a proper understanding of the passage considering that in Daniel's generation, get this, in Daniel's generation, the temple had just been destroyed and wasn't yet rebuilt. So here's Daniel, think about it, in exile, having just lived through the destruction of the temple and now he's getting an encounter, an angelic visitation concerning the destruction of the temple, which would then make you go, okay, was this, Lord, was this about the times past? Which is why the angels would then clarify and say, no, 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 this is about the time of the end, Daniel. Thus, wanting to clarify that this is not about future ju past judgment, it's about future season of debacle and tension related to the geopolitics of Jerusalem, which raises the question then, if it's a future rebuilt temple and a future destruction of that future rebuilt temple, is it referring to the second temple of Jesus's day, which was destroyed in 70 AD, or is it referring to a yet even future temple? We'll talk about that more as we get going, but this will be a key issue to settle in order to receive and to understand what Daniel was shown and why Daniel was shown what he was shown. Our fifth observation point that's important to understand is that Daniel contains events that are cross-referenced by the prophets and the apostles that bear the same language. So to get the fuller picture of what Daniel sees in verses 9 through 14, we need to familiarize, familiarize ourselves with a number of passages. Most notably, and you'll want to write these down or get these in the notes and go read them later. Some of them we're going to go through today. Revelation 12, 7 through 14. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Daniel 12, 1 through 7. 
Matthew 24, 15 through 31, and Revelation 13. There's more, but these are the main ones that I think you need to understand to tie together with Daniel 8. That's the same language, same events, same order, sequence of things that, that we need to understand. So with that, let's look at the outline here. I just broke these, the, these verses, 9 through 14, up into four different headers. Number one is verse 9, the rise of the little horn. That's what we're going to look at first. Then, verse 10, we see what we, we understand that there's coming a casting down and a trampling of what we'll get to shortly when, when we get into the text. But suffice it to say this, it's about casting something down and trampling that which was cast down. Verses 11 and 12 speaks of the transgression, the army, and the sacrifices. So we're going to learn about a transgression, a, an abominable event. We're going to read about a specific army that emerges in those days and the issue of the sacrifices in the temple. And then in verses 13 through 14, we're going to read about a period of time, specifically 2,300 days of trouble. So that's our outline that we're working through. Now we're just going to work our way through it. So look down at verse 9. This is where we're going to begin. (laughs) Excuse my allergies. Verse 9, the rise of the little horn. This is what we're going to look at first. One of, out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the north, toward the east, and toward the glorious land, Israel. Now, Joel's laid the context for this already. I'm not going to go into it. Some of this, Joel and I are going to mow over the same grass from different directions, so you're going to hear things that are, uh, have already been addressed, but it's, 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 I think it's important and essential that we mow over the grass multiple ways to, to rightly to rightly understand it. So if you haven't, go listen to Joel's session on Daniel 8 that sets the context for what leads up to this moment when this little horn emerges. A little horn. Let's take that phrase first. This speaks of this apocalyptic political leader that's going to emerge in the generation of the Lord's return, that he's going to start out with a... Uh, a degree of authority as a regional leader, but that authority is going to uh, turn into something much more dramatic. The, the equivalent here is, you know, Adolf Hitler is, you know, not really taken seriously. And then, you know, he's a little horn. He's a, he's a nobody. He was, uh, you know, the little corporal, they called him. And they mocked him. No one took him seriously. And then he, you know, the first time he runs for chancellor, I believe he got 20% of the vote not taken seriously. Then he wins the vote, and very quickly he goes from, you know, Germany being a democracy to a full-blown dictatorship between, you know, January and March of the year of the elections, and then everything begins to unravel. And the, we see a parallel there with Adolf Hitler and the Little Horn. Now, concerning this issue of the Little Horn, it's it's worth pointing out here a theory, and then why the theory uh, shouldn't be taken seriously, and then we're going to move on from it. The theory is that this little horn refers to not the future Antichrist of the last generation, but he refers to a historical figure named Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a Syrian leader who emerged in a few generations before the birth of Jesus, who carried out a absolutely brutal campaign uh, targeting the Jewish people, targeting the city of Jerusalem, uh, defiled the sanctuary. It, 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 a lot of the stuff fits. You go, okay, he's a, you know, he's a persecuting leader. He, you know, invaded Jerusalem. He defiled the sanctuary. It makes sense. There's a couple problems with this, and then we're going to lay this to rest. Problem number one: Antiochus Epiphanes was not a little horn. He just was not. When you look at the the way that he emerged and the way that the scripture describes this man emerging, it's not the same man. He's not a little horn. He didn't emerge out of obscurity into nothing. Especially when we get to Daniel 11, which we'll get to in subsequent sessions, we see that this is not Antiochus Epiphanes because he nothing in his career matches up. Now, a lot of, for example, the 2,300 days, there just simply was nothing in his life, that nothing significant happened. There's nothing that matches up where you can go, oh, this is that. And commentators try, but it's, it's actually embarrassing when you look at it because you go, Guys, come on, you're like, that doesn't even, you're having to do so much twisting to make it fit. He's not a little horn. Yes, he was a political leader. Yes, he invaded Jerusalem. Yes, he defiled the sanctuary, but it's not this. That, that's a problem. The second problem, which is the big, big one, is that Jesus said, all of these events are yet future. After 
about 170, about 200 years after Antiochus Epiphanes carried out his campaign, Jesus says it's yet future. So if you, anyone who disagree, anyone who believes that Antiochus Epiphanes fulfilled Daniel 8, Jesus disagrees with you. So does Paul. Paul quotes this in 2 Thessalonians. It says, this is about the return of the Lord. It's yet future. That day has not come yet. So you're going up against Jesus and Paul. So from my perspective, it's not even worth engaging in that debate because you're basically just debating with Jesus and Paul at that point. And I'm just not comfortable doing that. Let the scholars who are comfortable doing that, let them do that. But we're just going to keep it simple and and take Jesus at his word and, and move on. So in the notes here, you can see some more details about this. But the emergence of the little horn is the rise of the Antichrist in verse 9. It's not the rise of Antiochus Epiphanes. It's the rise of the Antichrist. <laughs> Look at this phrase, grew exceedingly great. He grew exceedingly great. Every phrase, there's, it's such minimalism. It's only five verses, but there's so much in every one of these phrases, which is why we're going to go through it phrase by phrase. Out of one of the kingdoms that was divided comes forth a little horn. That little horn grew exceedingly great. This growth of power and influence and might is, it cannot be exaggerated, just how crushing this will be. The equivalent, again, going back to Hitler, the Nazi blitzkrieg, when the nations are just collapsing before them as they're rushing against these nations. The blitzkrieg of the little horn is going to be staggering to watch how much land and how much territory and how much influence and resources he's going to pull into his influence and how quickly he's going to do it, which is one of the reasons why he's such a significant event in and of himself and why he is and why he constitutes one of the primary and paramount signs of the end of the age. The South refers to Egypt, which we see in Daniel chapter 11, other passages. He has great venom great rage against Egypt. There's a big clash between the Egyptians and the Antichrist. We'll get to that later. And it says to the east. So this would be Iraq, Iran area. So the Middle East, let's call it the Middle East, and the glorious land of Israel. So Egypt, Assyria, ancient Assyria, land of ancient Assyria, and the land of Israel is the theater of his emergence and his great anger and hatred. This is very significant because there are theories, and Joel has touched on this and we'll touch on this more. You know, one of the pop cultural theories is that the, the uh, Antichrist would come from a revived Roman Empire. That's not what Daniel says. He says he's emerging from a Middle Eastern Empire and he's clashing with Middle Eastern nations. That's a very significant reality because today, most of the territories of all of these empires, if not all of them, are Islamic territories, Islamic regions of the earth. So we can see the emergence of a little horn coming from an Islamic area of the earth and then clashing with an Islamic area of the earth. So let's move on to the next section, verse 10. So, so far it's simple. A little horn emerges, he, it grows exceed, with great, great exceeding power and then he rushes to different areas of the Middle East, focusing on the glorious land in particular. Verse 10. This refers to, we're going to, once we get into this, you're going to see that this, there's a phrase. Actually, let's just, let's just read it and then we'll get into it. Verse 10. It grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars, it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. Now, this is one of the most uh, confusing and bizarre passages in Scripture that's kind of befuddled commentators and scholars for a very long time. And any commentary in the book of Daniel struggles with this verse and many of them will even admit we don't really know have a clue what this means it, it, it's fuzzy it's hazy we don't understand it i believe it is clear what it's saying and by comparing with a number of other scriptures we'll look at it in a moment but before we do that i want to note that there the this phrase trampled or cast down there's four things in daniel 8 9 through 14 that are trampled upon and cast down in this passage, within these five verses. Number one, it, it, verse 12, it says the truth is cast down and trampled on. Truth is cast down and trampled on. The second thing is the host. The host is cast down and trampled on. What is the host? We'll talk about it in a minute. The third thing is the stars. The stars are cast down and trampled on. What does that mean, the host and the stars? 
Again, I think it's pretty simple when we look at it here in a moment, but I'm, I'm just going through the list so that you can see just how much of a, a, a trend and a reality this is in the generation of the Lord's return that casting things down and trampling upon them will be the MO of the final Antichrist beast empire and of this individual. Casting down and trampling the truth, the host, the stars, and the fourth thing is the sanctuary. The sanctuary is going to trample the sanctuary, defile the sanctuary, trod upon the holy city of Jerusalem. So that said, if you're tracking with the notes, we're now on the third page, top of the third page. Let's talk about this phrase, it grew up. Okay, The little horn will grow up to the host of heaven. Now, some see this as, you know, setting off a sort of heavenly chain reaction sort of thing that happens in the heavenly. So I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I think it's it's become clouded with traditional theology that wasn't quite rooted in uh, proper contextualization of other passages. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Let's, let's look at Revelation chapter 12, specifically verse 7. Actually, let's do this. Let's do this. Turn to Daniel chapter 12. This is going to kind of be a quick bounce around, but turn with me to Daniel chapter 12. We're going to compare a couple passages, and then I want you to, we'll go back to Daniel chapter 8 and look at these passages. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who is the charge of your people, Daniel. So Michael will stand up at this appointed time. The prince who has charge over your people, the Jewish people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation until that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. But those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The stars forever and ever. This is significant. Look at over at verse 33 in chapter 11. Okay? Chapter 11, verse 32. This is right after the abomination of desolation is set up. The wise among the people, the masculine, those who understand or who have revelation, The wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by the sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, and many shall join themselves to them with flattery, and some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. So the wise who are being plundered and trodden down or trampled down or cast down and persecuted and and violated in these days are going to be refined until the time of the end. That's chapter 11. Chapter 12 says that they're going to be like the stars in the heavens and they're going to shine bright like this firmament, bright like the stars in the heaven. Now flip over to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Now, war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. Okay, so now we're looking at cross-referencing language. Michael stands up in, in Daniel chapter 12 to defend the Jewish people during a time of great trouble. In chapter 12 of Revelation, we see war breaks out in heaven and Michael and his angels fight against the dragon. We have to see these two events as being connected. You have to. The only mentions of Michael in the scriptures standing up is this eschatological reality in the time of trouble when the great war breaks out. So what we're looking at here is the great tribulation of Daniel chapter 12 is the great war of Revelation chapter 12. It goes on to say this, The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, thrown down, 
that ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down, cast down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom, and the authority of our Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. They've conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. They love not their lives even unto death. Look at this. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So we have a short time of wrath. We have Michael standing up. We have the that we have Satan being cast down out of heaven, out of his sanctuary, out of his abode in the heavenly places, being cast to the earth, knowing his time is short. So look at the order of events here. We have at the time of the little horn emerging, we have a casting down of truth, a casting down of the saints. We have the standing up of angel Michael, we have the defense of the Jewish people, and we have many falling by plunder in captivity in those days. Now we could go to Revelation 13, we could go to Daniel chapter 7, and we could look at the same thing, that it's granted unto the beast to overcome or to wear down or to crush the saints during that time. So these are the main themes that we're looking at in all these different passages. Now why is this important? One of the reasons why this is important is because it gives context for who and what is actually being cast down and thrown down in these texts here. The little horn grew up, verse 10, to the host of heaven. This is going to be incredible, the rise of this man. And it, it, the little horn, is the one who casts, is the caster. Cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. So this, the, the Antichrist is casting down hosts and stars and trampling them. Now, some people have connected this to Dan- Revelation 12 and said, well, see, look, the devil, when he's cast down, his angels are cast down with him. I don't actually think that the casting of the stars or the host in Daniel 8 is the casting down of Satan and his angels in Revelation 12, I actually think it's the casting down and the trampling upon the saints who will shine like the stars of heaven. When you compare Daniel chapter 12 and Daniel 11 to Daniel 8, we're we're seeing that the, the people who are described as stars are the saints who are being trod under the foot of the Antichrist, who are being decimated. Which makes a lot of sense then why in Revelation 12, when this great war breaks out, Those, when the war breaks out, what happens? Satan is cast out of heaven. He's cast out of his sanctuary. And that's the very thing that we read in these passages here, which we're going to see when we get to verse 11 and 12. We see the exact same description. We see the the casting out of the sanctuary. It's a, a very interesting language. We'll get to it in a minute here. Now, some people see these the casting of the stars and see they understand them as the casting out of angels but if it's angels it doesn't make any sense because why how would you cast angels and then trample angels it doesn't really make sense especially when we consider the fact that the trampling is one of the prelim, is one of the main signs throughout the book of uh, of Daniel and Revelation is the saints being trampled the saints being crushed the saints being persecuted which is why if that's one of the main prophetic themes in the book of Daniel, it makes sense then why in his great rise to power, why he would cast the saints down and trample upon them. Let's look at the next verse in our next section, the transgression, the army, and the sacrifices. These are the three main themes of verses 11 and 12. We're going to see the transgression, we're going to see the army, and then we're going to see the, the sanctuary, the sacrifices brought to a screeching halt. Verse 11, he even exalted himself. Okay, so we have the rise in verse 9. And number 10, we have the casting out and the trampling down. 
Those are the things we've seen so far. Antichrist rises, Antichrist casts down and tramples underfoot the host and the stars as he rises up to the host of heaven. Now, the host of heaven is a very, very significant statement because this is referring to the Lord of hosts himself. This is a rise in power that it's, it's, he's rising up even to the Lord himself, meaning the affront, the open conflict between the Antichrist, who will be the counterpart of Messiah himself in a demonic counterpart sense, in a demonic incarnation sense. This will become clear as we move through the rest of the chapter as well. And we compare this with 2 Thessalonians in the book of Revelation, that at this moment when this transgression, this abomination of desolation is set up, something significant cracks open in the spirit and in the natural. A great war breaks out in heaven, Revelation 12. The great tribulation begins in Daniel chapter 12. We see the saints are cast down and trampled upon. We also see something else emerging. Look at the next verse, verse 11. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. The prince of the host. This is Jesus. Now the other verse says, look in verse 10, the little horn grew up to the host of heaven. It grew up to the host of heaven. This is why people see the host of heaven as potentially angelic. But it doesn't make sense when the host of heaven is in the stars trample to the ground. Trample. How do you trample angels? It doesn't make sense. Verse 10, I understand, I, I understand verse 10 to be the casting down of the saints, the trampling of the saints. And in verse 11, as he's doing that, he's rising up in confrontation with the prince of the hosts, of the, the, the Lord of hosts. And by him, this is important, by him, the daily sacrifices are taken away. The daily sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem are taken away when he rises and when he casts the saints down and treads upon them. And when he rises in open confrontation with the Lord of hosts himself. Guys, this is a massively important prophecy that tells you a lot about the dynamics of the generation of the Lord's return. The Antichrist will cast the saints down and will rise up to openly confront the Lord. The next thing we see is this. The sacrifices are brought to an end when he rises up. And remember, as he rises, Michael rises. So now you have open conflict between Satan being manifested in the life of this vile man, the little horn, the man of sin. You also have Michael standing up and you have Jesus beginning to loose the judgment events of the book of Revelation as all of this is unfolding. But this is the pivotal moment, guys, when everything barrels forward, which is why Jesus would say in Matthew 24, verse 15, let the reader understand when you see the abomination of desolation, which we're going to see in a moment, flee Jerusalem, because all of the events are now going to begin to unfold. This is the singular event that the prophets and the apostles declared to be the linchpin, the hinge of history that will set everything in motion. Because, sorry, not, not because yet. We'll get to that in a second. By him, the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, who is his? That will define what sanctuary means. The place of his sanctuary. Now, the sanctuary of the man of sin this is, there's a, there's a mystery going on here. There's a profound mystery going on here because the man of sin will be the demonic incarnation of Satan himself who is being cast out of heaven at this moment that initiates the tribulation. The beast, the little horn, the man of sin, the antichrist is the demonic incarnation of the mystery of iniquity. This was not just some evil man. This is going to be a mystery comparable to the mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God himself. He's the promised seed, right? Well, there's also a demonic promised seed coming. There is a counterpart here, and this man is the promised counterpart. And what we're seeing here is he's being cast out of his sanctuary, which is the same thing we see in Revelation chapter 12. Now, this is going to become very important once we get to 2 Thessalonians. 
Because what we see is what someone is restraining he who restrains until he who restrains is taken out of the way that day cannot come. Who is restraining the revealing of the Antichrist? Who is restraining the revealing of the Antichrist? We'll get to that in a moment. But we can see this now in the preliminary lead up to it. The man of sin takes the sacrifices away as he's cast down out of his sanctuary. Look at the causative events. He rises and he's cast out of his sanctuary and the sacrifices are brought to a screeching halt. Which means then, guys, that the temple was rebuilt, the sacrifices have been reinstated, and he's ending them. He's ending them. On what day is he ending them? The day that he's cast out of his sanctuary. The man of sin's sanctuary is actually a heavenly sanctuary. He's being cast out of heaven, and this is the Revelation 12 being cast out for his time is short. He's going to be thrown down to the earth. This is the same event. The book of Revelation chapter 12 being cast out of heaven is the same event in Daniel chapter 8. Look at this. Because of transgression, if, if that was lost on you, we'll come back to it. Don't worry. Because of the transgression or because of the abomination, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. This is very important language, guys. Because of the transgression, the abomination, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth to the ground. So look at the order of events. Antichrist is emerging He's being cast out of his sanctuary, so he ends the sacrifices, and an army is given to him. This will be the beast's army, the coalition of nations that form a military alliance to execute the ambitions of his dark and evil heart. This is the, the nations, the confederacy of nations that Joel's been talking about in our last sessions. This is going to become an empire, an army is going to rise up. This isn't just an individual, but this is an army is being given to him. Now, this is very significant because what this does is it puts this issue of the final tribulation squarely in the context of military conflict. The fact that an army is being given over to the horn, guys, who's giving over their armies? It's going to be regional powers, and it's also going to be Satan, and it's also going to be God. God is granting him authority to execute this. Satan is giving the beast his authority. It says in Revelation 13 that, the, that Satan, the dragon, gives his authority to the beast. This is the casting down out of his sanctuary. He's forced out of heaven, expelled from his sanctuary, so he gives his authority to the beast, to the man of sin. And as he gives that authority, he opposes the sacrifices, brings them to a halt, and begins to trample upon truth. He begins to trample upon the, the people of the covenant, the Jewish people, and the saints, those who are wise and who understand. And he's also trampling upon the sanctuary itself by establishing what's called the abomination of desolation, this catalytic event that sets the tribulation in motion. He did all this and prospered. He did all this and prospered. And the notes here, we've just got these, these phrases, a couple sentences for each one. Just want to point out the phrase that he exalted himself. The Antichrist will exalt himself as high as Jesus himself. It's going to be total pomp and arrogance to exalt himself, to oppose the Lord of hosts himself. Now, Jesus is the Lord of hosts, and this, this prophecy from, from Daniel chapter 8, Paul quotes this and references this in 2 Thessalonians, which we're going to get to in a moment. There is absolutely zero evidence for this kind of event happening in the life of Antiochus Epiphanes, guys. Just didn't happen. 
the level of blasphemy, the level of decimation, destruction, the finality, the eschatological consequence, none of this stuff happened with Antiochus Epiphanes. He was no little horn, and he was no man of sin the way that the scriptures define and describe this man of sin. You know, we'll get to it in a minute here, but 2 Thessalonians says this, he, Paul, this is Paul, the Apostle Paul, he's saying this, he, the Antichrist, will exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul describes what Daniel was told in Daniel 8. He's going to rise up to the prince of the host of heaven himself. And Paul says, well, that what that looks like is him exalting himself above all that is called God, taking his seat in the very temple of God. It's pretty powerful, guys. The daily sacrifices. This is a very important concept because what this does is it forces us to grapple with the reality that the end of the age will not come without a rebuilt temple and the reinstating of temple sacrifices. Can you imagine the horror of the international community when Orthodox Jews begin killing animals on the Temple Mount. It's going to be unbelievable to watch what's going to happen in terms of the international provocation. Our friend Reggie Kelly uses a phrase in, in, that I think is quite helpful. He says it's the, we, we need to understand the prophetic necessity of a third temple even before the destruction of the second. I'm going to say that again. He said we need to understand the prophetic necessity of a third temple even before the destruction of the second. Meaning this, Daniel hasn't even lived, he hasn't even seen the rebuilt temple, the second one, after it was destroyed in his generation. And what, what we need to grapple with here is the reality, the prophetic necessity, as Reggie says, of a third temple beyond even the second temple. Because the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD, which then leaves all of this in the realm of can't happen yet. Can't happen yet because it didn't happen in 78 and it couldn't happen during Antiochus Epiphanes either. It couldn't have happened because the cleansing of the temple didn't happen in the wake of it and the consummation of the age didn't happen. You just simply didn't have either the negative dynamics of Antiochus Epiphanes and you didn't have the positive dimensions of the restoration of all things, which we're, we're going to get to when we get to Daniel 9 and Daniel 10. The transgression is a very important phrase. The transgression, the sin, the iniquity. Because of this iniquity, because of the sin, an army is going to be given over to him. This army will be one of the most powerful armies, the most powerful army the earth has ever known. He's going to cast truth down and seek to destroy truth. Truth, not, not you know, truth in some intellectual sense. Truth in an existential sense, meaning reality itself. He's going to do violence against truth and reality itself. Can't imagine the level of deception and delusion that's going to go forth in that day, which is why Paul would also say that those in that day who do not love the truth will be given over to a strong delusion. So Paul, when talking about the Antichrist, talks about the need for loving truth in 2 Thessalonians. Love the truth. And the last phrase here is the phrase prospered. In verse 24, we're not looking at this. This is further later. I think Joel's going to hit this in the next session. But in verse 24, it says this, His power shall be mighty. He shall destroy and he shall prosper. He shall destroy and he shall prosper. Chilling. Chilling, guys, the level of authority that's going to be granted to this man through sovereign providence of God and through the aggression and the hatred and the violence of Satan himself that will be given over to the beast at that time. Let's look at our fourth and, and final section here in the passage, that being the 2,300 days of trouble. So, so far we've seen how the Antichrist rises We've seen how he casts down and tramples upon the stars, the host of heaven, who in the rest of Daniel are referred to as the saints who understand, who I believe is also being cast down in the book of Revelation and trampled upon, just like in Daniel chapter 7. And now we've seen 
that there's an army going to be given to him. We're going to see his rise and exaltation. We're going to see him ending sacrifices in Jerusalem. Now it gets pretty intense, as if it weren't intense already. Verse 13. I heard a holy one, which is an angel, speaking, and another holy one. He said to the other one, How long will the vision be, this vision concerning the rising up of the little horn, the trampling down, the giving of the army, and the ending of sacrifices? How long will these things be? Concerning, look at the definition here, because this is is the interpretive key. How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation. Now, what's interesting here is in our last verse, we read the word transgression, but he didn't connect it to desolation. But the angels say the transgression is the transgression of desolation or the abomination of desolation, which is the language Jesus used in Matthew 24, verse 15, to say this is the preeminent sign of the end of the age is the abomination of desolation. Which is why I believe Daniel chapter 8 is one of the most significant prophetic passages in the whole of Scripture that gives you the details of the lead up to the return of the Lord. So he says, How long will the vision be, the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? So we have two sanctuaries going on here. Sanctuary number one is the little horn being cast out of his sanctuary. The other sanctuary is the trotting down, the trampling upon the sanctuary of the temple in Jerusalem. This is the term that Jesus uses as well as Matthew 23 and Matthew 24, the sanctuary. Paul uses the same term in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that the, he stands in the temple, the sanctuary of God, that the sanctuary, the holy place will be destroyed. It will be defiled. Revelation 11 tells us the same thing, that the city will be trampled upon by the Gentiles. Revelation chapter 12 and 13 tell us the same thing, that there's violence being executed against the sanctuary, the temple, the city of Jerusalem. So there's two sanctuaries. He's getting cast out of his heavenly sanctuary where right now he enjoys a degree of autonomy. That's why he's called the God of this age. Paul called Satan the God of this age who's roaming around like a roaring lion. But his days are numbered because one day he's going to be cast out of that abode. And when he's cast out, he's going to give his authority to the little horn, the beast, the Antichrist. So the question is, how long will the vision be of the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled in their foot? Look at that language. Both the sanctuary, both, both. So the temple, the sanctuary is going to be trampled and the host. Again, if the hosts, it doesn't make sense if the hosts are angels. It does make sense if the hosts are the people of God. The saints who are being trampled and plundered and refined and made white, who are given over to martyrdom in mass by loving their lives not unto death, by overcoming him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. All of these passages just gel perfectly together. So abomination of desolation, the the trampling of the sanctuary and the trampling of the saints. How long? will these things be? What will the vision be? How long? Can you feel the how long will these things be? And the angel said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Then the sanctuary will be cleansed. What does this mean? First of all, let's talk about the fact that there's an angelic conversation happening. That's significant. In verse 13, he hears an angel talking to an angel. And then whenever you hear angels talking to one another, it's not so that the angels can understand, it's so that we can understand. Which means this, the Lord wants you to understand this. He sent the angel Gabriel to help Daniel to help us understand this. And while it is sealed until the time of the end, that seal is starting to lift and he's giving clarity and revelation about these things. So takeaway point number one here in this passage in verse 13 is that he wants us to understand it. Second takeaway passage here is regarding the abomination of desolation. This is the first reference in all of scripture, guys, that refers to this phrase of this expression, the abomination of desolation. He calls it the transgression 
of desolation here. Later in Daniel chapter 9 and in Daniel chapter 11 and 12, he'll call it the abomination of desolation. But guys, I want you to feel this. When Jesus was asked in Matthew 24 what the signs of his return would be, he quoted the phrase, the abomination or transgression that causes desolation. This is the first time in scripture that it's mentioned, which is why I believe it's one of the most important passages in the whole Bible to understand concerning the nature of the unfolding of the events and the generation of the Lord's return. The sanctuary shall be cleansed. The sanctuary shall be cleansed. Look at the sanctuary. The sanctuary is mentioned twice in verse 13, 14. The sanctuary will be trampled underfoot and the sanctuary will be cleansed. The sanctuary will be trampled underfoot and the sanctuary will be cleansed. There's a very interesting passage in Daniel chapter 12. I'm, I'm going to read it to you in verse 11. From the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,200 and 90 days. From the time that it's taken away and the temple is cleansed, it will be 1,290 days. That's three and a half years plus a month. 1,260 days plus a month. 42 months plus a month. So 43 months. It's the second half of Daniel's 70th week, which we're going to look at once we get to Daniel chapter 9. But he says this. Right now he hasn't laid out that. We, we don't have that framework yet. Daniel hasn't been given that framework. The framework that he's been given, and which is why Daniel 8 is so significant, is because in terms of the law of first mentions, the first time the abomination of desolation is mentioned. And secondly, it's the first time that a time frame is given that tells us the time from point A to point B. Now, in Daniel chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 12, he tells us that the time from the time that the abomination of desolation is set up and the time that the temple is cleansed, it will be 1290 days, three and a half years. But what Daniel 8 tells us is that it's, this isn't point A in Daniel 8. Follow me. We have two different point A and point B. In Daniel 12, point A is the abomination and point B is the end of all things. And he says that's 1,290 days until the temple is cleansed, okay? Daniel 8, he gives us a different point A. The point A is not the taking away of sacrifices, but the beginning of sacrifices, the beginning of regular sacrifices. Now, he's going to oppose the regular sacrifices, it says, the Antichrist. He's going to oppose them. And from the moment that they start, which is 2,300 days, through to the cleansing of the temple will be 2,300 days. I'm just going to read this through again because we're getting lost in the details, I think, by hearing all the numbers. If you're like me and you're terrible at numbers and math, you're, you're shutting down because you're going, oh, no, numbers. Some of you love numbers and it's making sense, but let me just read it again so you can hear it wash over you. I'll just start in verse 12. And a host will be given over together with the regular burnt offering. Okay. A host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering. Because of the transgression, it will throw truth to the ground. The little horn will act and will prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to the one who spoke, How long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering? Meaning the beginning of the regular burnt offering once it starts. The transgression that ends the regular burnt offering and the giving over of the sanctuary in the wake of the halting of the regular offering, the sacrifices. And he said, it will be 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Now, there's a lot in there, but it's also very simple. Okay, 
He says this, how long will it be from the regular burnt offering and then the transgression and then the trampling until the time of the end and the restoration of the holy place to its rightful state? And he says 2,300 days, which means this, guys, this is massive. From the moment that you see sacrifices beginning in Jerusalem, you can put a countdown on for 2,300 days. It will be 2,300 days until the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Now, I love thinking about this because we're we're in, you know, apocalyptic literature right now. But how many of you know that there was already a cleansing of the temple? In Matthew 21, Jesus went into the temple on his triumphal entry and cleansed it. Remember that? Well, guys, let me just make this very clear when Jesus returns, he's going to cleanse the temple again. He's not coming back to, I mean, this is, this is wildly significant. Jesus is not returning to just some random place and he's going to be like, well, you know, here's a good place. Set up my throne over there. It's not random. It's not arbitrary. He's coming back to a specific place and he's going to restore and clean the sanctuary. Just like he cleansed the temple when he came the first time. What he was doing by cleansing the temple in Matthew 21 was not a way of setting in motion the replacement of Israel, the divestment of national Israel, and the total redefinition of all these biblical terms as the replacement theologians would tell us. No, he whipped people out of the temple to declare that he was and is and will be the man that will carry out the final cleansing and restoration of the temple and the sanctuary and the holy place at the end. He's the one who's going to do that. And the fact that he was doing it then, he was saying, I have zeal. Remember what he quoted? The zeal for my father's house has eaten me up. Guys, There's zeal in the heart of Jesus for the temple and for the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary and the holy place. Now, we who've grown up in kind of Protestant, Greek, Western, pop cultural Christianity, we've been told our whole lives that Jesus came to destroy the temple because he's not interested in temples and that we are the temple. And we have, we have, we've been ingrained and indoctrinated to believe that because the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, there's no more relevance to the issue of the temple in general at all. And what Daniel tells us is this is no, no, no. The temple is wildly significant. In fact, it's of paramount prophetic importance for understanding what's going to happen in the generation of the Lord's return. Number one. Number two, Jesus, when he comes back, he's not going to destroy The temple, he's going to restore the temple. Now, this is very an interesting dynamic because you basically we're looking at two future restored temples. We're going to have the temple that's rebuilt that sets in motion the tribulation, the the provocative dynamics that set in motion the tribulation, and the temple is going to be defiled and, and desolated. Because he's going to stand. The Antichrist will defile the sanctuary, will end the sacrifices. Jesus will return and he will do what? He will restore the holy place and restore the temple sacrifices. And you go, whoa, temple sacrifices? Jesus is going to reinstate temple sacrifices? It's a crazy thought, but it's true. It says in the book of Ezekiel that in the millennial age, when the Lord returns, there will be sacrifices being offered in Jerusalem. Now, this is a subject on its own that we, we, we'll get into at a later time, but I'm bringing it up here to say this because this is also always what's brought up. Because you guys who care about the temple are reverting back into types and shadows of the Old Testament, and you're saying that we need to go back and shed the blood of animals. Well, haven't you read the book of Hebrews? It says that the blood of bulls and goats is not enough, and the blood of the Son of God is enough. And if you go back, you're trampling on the blood of Christ. Guys, the book of Hebrews is not in contradiction to the book of Ezekiel or to the book of Daniel. It's not in contradiction to it. When Jesus destroyed the temple in John 3, when he said, I'm going to destroy the temple, in Luke 21, when he said, I'm going to destroy the temple, when Matthew 24 said, I'm going to destroy the temple, he's also the one who's going to restore the temple. It's the same Jesus saying the same things. Now we get hung up and we pit scriptural friends against each other and say, well, this verse says this. Well, okay. Yeah, but this one says this. You have to affirm all of scripture. You don't get to choose what you want and eliminate the rest of it, redefine it. So you ask the question then, if there's no temple right now, 
Does that mean that this is one of the primary signs of the times? Yes, absolutely. Once you see the temple being rebuilt, once you see the sacrifices starting, you can know that in 2,300 days, Jesus himself will personally restore the temple to its rightful state. Now you're, you're stumbling over it and you're going, wait, so you mean to tell me Jesus, the Lamb of God, is going to come back, restore the temple, and then reinstate temple sacrifices? Why would you still shed the blood of animals if what? We'll get into that in a later time, but I want to put that on, on the table to fry your circuits a little bit. Because what we see in the age to come is a lot of things happening in Jerusalem that we're unprepared for. Not like you need to prepare for that, but meaning we're unprepared for it in the sense that we never thought about it. We go, what? Why? Why would that be happening? Now, to be clear, I don't think the sacrifices during the tribulation, and I'm saying all that to say this, I don't believe the sacrifices during the tribulation period or after the second coming and the restoration of the temple, those sacrifices are not going to be salvific or saving or redeeming. Okay, let me make this very clear because people can take this and go into really weird places with it. And they can accuse you of saying that we need to shed the blood of bulls and goats in order to make atonement for sin. That's not what we're saying at all. In fact, we're saying the opposite. As this blood, the blood sacrifices are returning to Jerusalem, one of the witnesses of the church globally to the nation of Israel will be to say that, guys, that blood can't save you. That blood cannot save you. So we're not, you know, the, some of the detractors and critics of a future expectation of a future temple will criticize the idea that there's coming future sacrifice. And they'll say, see those dumb, you know, end time kooky guys are anticipating, they're, they're calling for sacrifices. Don't they know that they're, you know, that's an affront to God who bled on the cross. Guys, we, we don't believe that the sacrifices that Daniel 8 speaks of are salvific. They're not providing atonement. Only the blood of the Son can provide everlasting righteousness. That's clear. The book of Hebrews is clear about that. But inasmuch as Hebrews is clear that only his blood can atone, the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Revelation, the book of 2 Thessalonians de declares to us emphatically that in the generation of the Lord's return, a temple will be will be rebuilt, sacrifices will be reinstated, and then they will be brought to a screeching halt. And then at the end of that period of tribulation, Jesus himself will restore the temple to its rightful place. Which means we also don't believe that any future expression of sacrifices in a millennial temple are salvific. Only the blood of the Son is. So we could say the blood of the Orthodox Jews during the tribulation that's being shed of animals is an insufficient shedding of blood. We could also say that this shedding of the blood of animals in the millennial kingdom is also going to be insufficient for providing atonement because it's already been shed. So the priesthood is going to be set back in place, but more as an honor, an, an expression of honor and devotion and worship, not making atonement for the nation. Atonement is only in the blood of Christ, only in the blood of Christ. That has been, that will always be for endless ages. We will sing of that, the sufficiency of his blood and his blood alone. But don't let anyone tell you that because the blood of Jesus is enough that you should scoff or mock at the simple prophecies provided in the scripture for us concerning the end of the age. Namely, that there will not be another temple because this somehow delegitimizes the sufficiency of the blood of Jesus. No, it doesn't make any sense. We affirm all that scripture says. And again, like I said at the beginning, we shout what scripture shouts, we whisper what, what scripture whispers, and we're silent about what scripture is silent about. So I want to look at one last passage that I, I think will make put things into context and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is a text we're going to come back to in subsequent chapters when we get through the book of Daniel. But I really want you to see the the language in this for a number of reasons. One, to give you an understanding of what the restrainer is and what the process will look like of the expulsion of Satan out of his heavenly domain, casting down to earth and how this will set in motion 
the rise of the little horn that will bring the sacrifices to a close, that will bring the beginning of the great tribulation, which will set in motion Dan, uh, Gabriel, sorry, Michael standing up, which will also see Gabriel's prophecy of in Daniel chapter 8 coming to pass in the theater of time and space. Look at chapter 2, verse 2. Sorry, verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So he says, look, guys, the day of the Lord, which is the second coming and our gathering together, it hasn't come yet. Okay? Don't, no matter what anyone says, trust me, it hasn't come yet. Verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion or the falling away comes first. And the man of lawlessness or the man of sin or the son of perdition is revealed. Look at the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. This is Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 verbatim, which means as Paul saying, look, guys, you have no need that I write to you. I've already written to you guys about this stuff. You already know this. I told you. You understand this. This is basics, which means as for Paul, Daniel 8 was basics. Daniel 11 was basics. It should be basics for us too. Verse 5, do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you all these things? In other words, guys, I, you know this. You don't need me to expound on this. You're aware of it. I mean, I'll circle back on it and mow over the grass again, but you, you have already know this. You've heard this. Verse 6, this is where it gets interesting. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. So who is the he and his, Okay. The man of sin, the son of production, who, perdition, who exalts himself above everything, who rises up, the little horn. You know what is restraining him now. So that he may be revealed in his time. Now, within the pre-tribulation camp, it's been taught, long taught that he who is restraining the revealing of the Antichrist is the Holy Spirit or is the church. When the church is removed, the Holy Spirit is taken, and the Antichrist reveals himself. This is completely incoherent. This doesn't make any sense. That's not in the scripture. That's not in the grammar. It's not anywhere else in scripture. We don't see, we don't see the Holy Spirit restraining the Antichrist. We don't, we don't see that happen. What we do see happening is something else. Verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The mystery of lawlessness. So he's the, the man of lawlessness, okay? And the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of transgression, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only, look at this, he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth. So it's the same thing, Daniel 8. Truth is being cast down as he's rising up. As truth is being cast down, he's rising up. What's happening? He's being forced out of his sanctuary. What does is, what is Revelation chapter 12 tell us? That Satan is cast out of heaven. And when he's cast out, he has great wrath for he knows his time is short. Meaning this, Satan does not want to lose his position, his abode, his sanctuary, his governmental authority in the heavenly places. He doesn't want to lose it or surrender it. 
he's being forced out. Which means this, if you had a conversation with Satan in his heavenly abode and you said to him, hey, are you, do you, do you want this age to end? He would say, no, because that's the day of my destruction. I don't want that. I want to maintain my position and the power and my, as the God of this age with the powers of the air, I want to maintain this position that I have. We see in the book of Job, he's ro- roaming around. He can come into the throne room and talk. He has a degree of autonomy under God's sovereign providential oversight. That will change, guys, as the great tribulation begins. I want to submit what I believe to be the simplest understanding of he who now restrains when he's taken out of the way. Do you know who's restraining the revealing of the Antichrist? It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the church. It's not the angel Gabriel or Michael. It's Satan himself. Satan is restraining. He's restraining the revealing of the Antichrist because he doesn't want it. You go, wait, we've always pictured him like, you know, Fiending, you know, like he wants, you know, he's excited for the Antichrist. No, he knows, guys, once he's cast out of heaven, he knows his time is short. He's going to have great wrath and great fury, and he's going to be lashing out to destroy and to devote many to destruction. His rise, look at all the passages. He's cast out of heaven, and when he's cast out of heaven, he gives his authority to the beast, and the beast rises. So the catalytic event in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, is in Daniel 8, it says that he's cast out of, cast down, thrown out of his sanctuary. Revelation 12 says he's cast down out of heaven. There's no place left for him in heaven. And it says, woe to you, earth, because now Satan has come down to you with great wrath and great fury. His great wrath is because he who was restraining the end of all things because he's terrified of his ultimate demise, he's restraining it. But his restraint is brought to a bitter end when he is cast out and thrust down to the earth. And as he's cast down, the mystery of iniquity is made manifest on the earth as he gives in this demonic incarnation, he gives his authority to the beast. And that giving of authority causes the trampling down of truth, the trampling down of the city of Jerusalem, the trampling down of the people of God, the trampling down of the temple and the beginning of the great tribulation which sets in motion Michael standing up in defense of the people and Revelation 12, 7, a great war in heaven breaking out. I want to encourage you, take some time and read 2 Thessalonians next to Daniel 8 and read it next to Revelation chapter 12. This makes sense then why Satan would be cast out of heaven. You don't, you're not cast out of somewhere that, that you want to leave. You know, we, the idea, because the, the opposition to the idea that Satan could, could be the restrainer is the idea that, well, why would Satan not want the Antichrist to be revealed? But think about it logically, guys. Why would Sa- If Satan's being cast out of heaven in Revelation 12, if he's being thrown down out of his sanctuary in Daniel chapter 8, that means he doesn't want to go, guys. And if he doesn't want to go, you have to ask the question, why does Satan not want to go and get cast out of heaven? Because he knows that his time is short and he has great wrath. When he's cast down, now his only option is to devote many to destruction and to carry out a suicide mission to destroy as many as possible because he knows his days are numbered and his final demise is imminent. And he knows the days just as much as we know the days. And here's the crazy thing, guys. I'm going to quote a a, a statement from Reggie Kelly that's just brilliant. Reggie's been instrumental in in over the years as I've wrestled through this and asking Reggie about it. And he said this statement to me one time. He said this, Dalton, the demise of the devil is in the details of Daniel. Think about that. The demise of the devil is in the details of Daniel. Meaning this, he's cast out of his abode And he goes forth in great fury, devoting many to destruction. And he meets his bitter end 
at the second coming of Jesus, when Jesus comes and destroys him with the breath of his mouth at his appearing, at his return. His demise is connected to Jesus' cleansing of the temple. He, when he comes, because think about it, the devil, he knows that Jesus is going to cleanse the temple upon his return, which is why the devil incarnate in the man of sin and the mystery of iniquity would go to the very place that Jesus will establish his throne to defile it and to cause desolation, which is why Jesus will return there to cleanse that which has been defiled and to execute the one who did the defiling because the one who did the defiling was cast out of heaven because he was the one who is restraining these events from unfolding. And here's the bottom line and how we can seal this thing up in terms of the confirmation that the, re- the restrainer is the Satan himself is this, is that the moment he's cast out of heaven is the moment the man of sin is revealed. So if he is not the restrainer, something else is, and what is it? Whatever it is, it's connected to him being cast out of heaven, which means this, the single most catalytic event being the abomination of desolation that sets in motion the tribulation, that event happens because Satan is cast out of his position of authority in heavenly places and thrown to the earth knowing his time is short. And that short, that knowledge of shortness is what causes the great wrath and the great fury to go forth to, dis- to, to, do, to devote many to destruction. So let's bring this in for a landing. We see in verse 9, the little horn rising. We see in verse 10, the little horn casting down and trampling upon a number of things. The saints, truth, the temple itself. And we see in verses 11 and 12, we see the transgression. We see the army that, it, that rises and we see the ending of sacrifices. And in verses 13 and 14, we see that there's going to be 2,300 days from the start of the temple sacrifices to the cleansing of the temple. And we know that from Daniel chapter 12, in the middle of that 2,300 days, at the 1,290-day mark, the sacrifices will cease. So 2,300 days from the cleansing, the sacrifices start. 1,290 days from the cleansing, the sacrifices end. 2,300 days, 1,290 days. Guys, this is, I'm just so grateful for the raw simplicity of scripture. This is why we need to understand the signs of the times. Because when Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour, he had full knowledge that Gabriel came and told us the dates from the moment that the sacrifices are set up until they're torn down to the cleansing of the temple at the return of Jesus, we know specifically how many days it's going to be. When Jesus says no one knows, he's not saying you can't know or you shouldn't know. He says right now you don't know and you will not be able to know until you see the temple sacrifices start. Then you can, you must, you should know. You're required to know that from the 2,300 day mark, To the end, that's where all of the prophetic events in the book of Daniel, the book of Isaiah, the book of you name it, is going to fall within that concentrated time frame that leads up to the final 1290 days right before the cleansing of the sanctuary and the restoration of all things. Now, I'll say this in closing. Daniel 8 is like the seed form of the theology of the abomination of desolation and the cleansing of the temple at the return of the Lord. It's the seed that grows into a very large tree by the time we get to Daniel 12. We're going to look at it in our next chapter, Daniel 9, Daniel 10, 11, and 12. This abomination of desolation, the framework, the story, the unfolding drama in these chapters is, we get vivid detail in these chapters. It's important for us to understand. But suffice it to say this, Daniel chapter 8 is significant because it's the first time that we're told about the abomination of desolation and the time frame between the sacrifices and the close of this present age. 
Joel's going to pick up in our next session the final verses of Daniel chapter 8 and bring this chapter to a close. But Daniel 8 is a very, very significant chapter that we need to spend time in and we need to get familiar in. And we need to cross-reference and study the other passages connected to Daniel 8 because this is the foundational text that the prophets and the apostles would build their eschatology and their day of the Lord proclamation ministry upon, and therefore so should we. Maranatha.